so I thought to um, start at the beginning and talk a little bit about how did uh, we get here. Um, my first formal work was at Intech College. Before that, I was studying, I was doing part-time jobs. But my first, uh, you know, serious full, full-time job was at Intech College. And because I'm actually qualified in journalism and in translation, uh, I started my working life there in the publishing division, working on study material. Uh, after that, I moved to marketing. Uh, I worked many, many years in marketing, course development. Uh, I worked on accreditation. Uh, there's a lot to learn when you start working on the accreditation of a college. Uh, there's lots of regulation and the regulation changes. So one has to stay on top of that to make sure that you uh, comply with all of those regulations. Uh, while I was at Intec, uh, it, it was sold to Educor. Um, Educor is like a, a conglomerate, a, a group of colleges. They were buying in more and more colleges and, and us uh, group at Intec got exposed to seeing these other colleges. You know, it was international colleges group, they would buy in another college. So I got to see, you know, the insides of Lyceum College, uh, Damelin Correspondence, um, Rapid Results College, I don't think they exist anymore. Uh, RNB in home, so so we got exposed to all of these new uh, colleges, you know. And um, often, what happens is you you work for one college and you always think the other guys are so good or so big. But when you get to see the insides of other businesses similar to the one that you're working in, uh, there's always uh, interesting surprises. Uh, the things that they are bad at that you think they would be good at, things that they are good at that you thought they might be bad at. Uh, so I felt there was a lot of learning for all of us to get involved in these other colleges and that's also where I started thinking that um, to grow a college, one, all we knew when it came to growing a college or our primary way of growing colleges was to launch more and more new courses and as I started seeing these other colleges and as we started uh, as a marketing team working on more than one of the colleges uh, that got me thinking about how does one uh, successfully manage multiple distance learning colleges. I don't think we, we particularly got it right, um, but th that's where the idea comes from. You know, at the end of the story, I'll talk about launching another college, uh, and that's where I got the idea um, being part of a group where more and more colleges are brought into the group and you end up working on, on some or on all of them. Yeah, and I, and I think a key message for me was uh, you think. You know, you think if you're a successful team managing one college, you can easily also manage another college. But actually what happens is, um, whichever is the bigger entity tends to get more of your time, more of your people, more of your investment. Uh, and that's quite logical. Now, if, you have, if you've got one team that must manage two or three colleges, it's logical and it's good business that the focus is on the biggest one. But what happens is then you end up neglecting the smaller ones or you end up not um, growing the smaller ones as much as you could if that was your only focus. Kind of, I kind of felt we didn't quite get that right. Then I made that mistake at least one more time uh, and I'm still grappling with that uh, challenge. You know, how do you manage multiple businesses with a single team? While I was there, I actually participated in the starting of a new college, uh, Ilpa College, this was many years ago. Uh, and I also learned a lot of interesting things about starting a new college. Uh, I was also involved in a venture called Intec uh, Mozambique. Um, we started a college in Mozambique. Uh, I think I was the guy that ended up shutting it down, but there's all, all kinds of lessons one learns by doing difficult things. Uh, and of course, if they fail, you learn even uh, more lessons uh, than if they succeed. So after, I think about 16 years at Intec, um, I got opportunity to start my own thing. I started uh, College SA. In actual fact, uh, I, I was kind of doing it with the guys from the Kuro schools. They were at that time, I think they had uh, three schools at that time. And I said, guys, let's do something together. So for the first few months, it was actually um, Kuro College. Uh, but they, you know, their focus was schools and mine was distance learning. And, and the more we worked, the more we realized the businesses aren't really compatible, they're not really helping each other. So we, you know, went our separate ways really amicably. Uh, I had to change the college name actually then, 
and then I changed it from Kira College to uh, College SA, SA College of Home Study, P2 Limited. You've got to have an you know, official name. Uh, and um, that, that's kind of uh, where I started doing my own thing. I always think, you know, after 16 years at Intech, I thought I knew most of what one needs to know to run a distance learning business. Uh, maybe I knew half of what I needed to know. <laughs> If you, if I knew how difficult it would be, I probably wouldn't have uh, started. But in any case, I was uh, relatively young and idealistic, and I felt that in distance learning, in the distance learning industry, uh, there's three problems, there's three challenges, which I felt the, the the existing distance learning colleges didn't properly address. So my idea was to focus on those three problems solve those three problems for the students and and that's how i was going to differentiate that was how we're gonna we're going to build a business that's different um the problems being if i can say it in the words of the students you know the students had these three questions first question the students often asked where are my books uh, so it's a real challenge back then all distance learning colleges would uh, send books uh, in the post through the post office and it would take uh, three weeks or, or more from you sending the students books to the students actually getting those books so students often felt there's this huge amount of waiting when they must get more study materials so the first question was where, where are my books the second uh, problem where students would say i only hear from the college when they when they need money from me you know, most distance learning students are paying monthly. You're getting a phone call once a month from a person in student accounts uh, wanting to know whether you're going to pay. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, the students, they're, they're making a valid point. Even though they're adult learners, they need more proactive help. The college must also be pushing help to the student, not just waiting for the student to pull help out of the college. So, so the second question from the student side or the second problem uh, from the student's perspective, whereas you only call me when you want money. The third, um, the third problem or the third uh, issue I felt that the industry didn't deal with very smartly was when students wanted to cancel. Mm. Back then, you know, a college will easily tell you you can't cancel. Or if you want to cancel, you can cancel, but you must still pay the whole course fee. And you can imagine you've signed up for a two, three year program. After six months, you decide you want to cancel. Now, now you realize, now the students realize they signed a credit agreement. They can't get out of it. They've got to pay for 36 months, even though they've only studied for six months. And I felt that's just, uh, that's not good. So, you know, you need a cancellation policy. You need to be able to explain to people if they change their mind, if they're not happy with the service, if their life changes, how do they get out of their studies uh, without a huge penalty? So that was kind of the third thing uh, I felt we needed to address. Um, and out of that came, you, you know, things that I felt we were kind of first in the industry or the only people who did it. Um, things like we, we, we early on started to say, started couriering all study material. We stopped using the post office. So that was a huge uh, impact on students. You know, instead of waiting for three weeks, four weeks for your books, you're waiting three, four, five, maybe six working days at most. So that was a big uh, impact for students. Uh, we, ha we kind of had pay as you study. So um, as long as you study, you pay. As long as you pay, you study. If, you, if your life changes, if your studies doesn't make sense, if it's not working for you, in the end, the students could just uh, stop paying and there wasn't huge penalties. There was this easy cancellation process as well. Um, so you could get out. And, and around the to topic of payment, we also brought in a 30 day all money back guarantee. Um, just basically saying, listen, you've signed up. If in the 30, first 30 days anything happens that makes you not want to study with us, we're not going to ask questions. We're simply going to give you your money back. And that is that. Um, and, and in this way, we were really challenging, I felt, we were challenging the rest of the industry. The rest of the industry were not couriering, or very few people were couriering. They, they didn't have proper cancellation policies. They certainly didn't have stuff like a 30 day money back guarantee. We brought in um, study breaks. Like I said, we, we really acknowledge that our learners are probably adults and they're probably busy working. So if you know, you know, at work you're gonna be very busy in January, 
you can say to us, uh, I don't want to study in January, I'm not going to pay in January. Uh, we would give you a study break and a payment break. Uh, and that was quite a big uh, deal. I, I think it's still a big deal. So, so in the end, the, the idea was you've got to give more value, you've got to be more transparent. Um, even today, you know, people sign up uh, for distance learning and and you haven't studied via distance learning before, so you don't even know what questions to ask. Um, and what happens is you didn't ask who's going to pay for the books. You sign up, you start paying for your course and you get a book list and there's 6,000 rands worth of books that you must buy in addition to your course fees. So I'm quite allergic to hidden costs. Uh, we really focused on making sure that if there are additional costs that's not included in the course fee, then we tell the student that before the student signs up. And, and that issue of transparency uh, has always been quite important. Um, so the one thing was no, no hidden cost. So if there is an additional cost, you've got to tell the student that before they sign up so they understand there's an additional cost coming. Often around exams, Still these days, one find that, you know, the exam fee is an additional thing and it happens later, so it's not necessarily included in the course. I guess on the topic of transparency, on the topic of making sure people understand what it is that they sign up for before they sign up, I've done a lot of thinking. Um, and especially because accreditation is so important to students, you know, we, we, also, we got to the point of even using negative language to explain accreditation. And with negative language, I mean, if, a, if it's a short course, so it can't be accredited, you still say this is not accredited. You know, when you, when you write about it, when you write a web page or a brochure about it, you have a heading accreditation and under it you write, this course is not accredited. Um, so that you absolutely make sure that the person that signs up doesn't feel cheated, doesn't feel badly informed later on. It's like you, you, you've got to really properly inform a student uh, before they sign up. Um, and you need to understand it's a person who, not, who hasn't studied via distance learning before. So there's a lot of responsibility, I believe, on the college to really properly explain all the things that we know uh, is important, even though the student might not know it yet. But college is A, we grew, we, 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 early days we nearly died. You, know, you, you start up with some money, you spend all of that money, and then you realize you're not, uh, you don't have a big enough business to be sustainable. Um, but we found a way, marketing through sales, um, built a great marketing team, built a great sales team, and we got quite successful on the front end. And I felt I put the rules in place on the back end so students can't be uh, treated badly, students won't feel cheated, because you've built in rules to make sure that stuff doesn't happen. But still, in the end, I felt that we grew so fast, and I, uh, I, I was the one that should have pulled up the brakes. I didn't. Uh, in the end, we grew so fast that, that the growth uh, started killing us, you know, it's just suddenly you have a big business and nobody really knows how to properly manage a big business. You got big too fast and then the wheels starts coming off. At that point I got uh, people who were interested in, in investing. Uh, as things started going wrong, I happily took their money because that's how, how I kept the business going. Um, yeah, it, it got even worse. Uh, and then I felt cool, we, we were starting to kind of to pull things right. Uh, and by that time I've, <laughs> I've sold enough of the college that they could fire me, which, which they did. Yeah, so suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm selling the business. I've been doing this thing day and night for about nine years. I'm out of it. I've got some money out of it. Um, and that's an interesting place to be. It's uh, suddenly, you know, you, you're kind of forced into it. But still, you're forced into a situation of, now what, you know? You can start over, you can start over with a blank piece of paper. And I do think um, the bigger a business is and the older a business is, the more you are, shall I say, captured by what you set up initially. The, the longer you're going, the more difficult it becomes to change the fundamentals. The, the, the business gets a life of its own and it actually becomes quite difficult to change any major thing in it. So it was an interesting place for me to go, I've been struggling and struggling and struggling to change things in a business. Now I'm out of that business, I can start from scratch. How does one, how do you learn the lessons from, from what went wrong? How do you take the lessons from what went right and start over, you know, better and faster and smarter? Um, 
I was never really a systems or process kind of person. I'm not that disciplined, but um, coming out of that business, starting a new business, starting Skills Academy, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, bring one of the partners, uh, Tabitha, with me. Uh, and she's very much a systems and process person. So she, from day one, said, listen, we are building a business. We must build the whole business. It must be properly set up so that the whole thing works. And if we get to fast growth, we need to make sure that we can properly properly handle that growth. Um, so in that sense, it feels like Skills Academy, which, which was kind of round two for me, um, is much better set up. The systems are there, the processes are there, things work systematically um, and automatically, you know, it's, it's really properly uh, built. I inside College SA, obviously, I was pursuing the idea of uh, launching multiple colleges. So, I mean, I didn't start Seals Academy in 2016, I actually bought it out of uh, College SA and it was a very, very small college. Um, so, so it felt to me like, you know, it's the second time I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of involved in this mistake of you've got a big college and a small college, it's run by the same team and the small one will never grow because the big one grabs the focus, it grabs the investment. So starting over with Skills Academy, you know, uh, I still have these ideas <laughs> yeah, that one should and one can launch multiple colleges, but you need to think about how to do it uh, in a way that enables each college to work properly. And basically that means you've got to keep on working towards independence. So. Of course you use, if you have a college that's working, you use that to incubate, to start a new college. So initially the two are together, but you've got to keep on asking yourself, you've got to keep on challenging that and ask yourself, are there not ways to make the new college or the smaller college? You, you have to keep on challenging yourself and asking yourself, is there, are there not more ways to make that new college more independent? And you've got to keep on pushing towards independence. It is the, the more you make, the, the, the new college independent, I believe the better its chances to grow. And saying independence mean that it must have its own investment. You've got to push to the point where it has its own management team. Um, so it can really grow. The, the, there's people in that college and their focus is only that college. That's, in my opinion, how one gets the good growth. Um, two colleges, three colleges together often like I say, the, the big one gets attention and the other ones just, uh, they just never get the growth. I mean, to, to start a distance learning college is incredibly difficult and incredibly expensive. Um, it's nearly impossibly difficult. Um, but once you have one that works, to say I'm inside that college, I'm incubating, I'm starting another one, uh, to start that second one isn't, near, isn't nearly as difficult as to start the first one. Um, because the first one kind of subsidized the second one, the expertise is there, lots of stuff have been figured out that you can now copy and paste and just give to your new college. Um, which is one of the reasons I've always been keen to uh, develop multiple colleges. I feel that the investment in the first college can pay you back much more, um, can kind of pay you back in multiple colleges. So, so that kind of also talks, I guess, to, this, to the other big challenge. For me, the one big challenge was um, from the start set up proper systems and processes. Uh, my, my business partner Tabitha uh, Bailey did that very well uh, to the point where we appointed the CEO uh, Rashad uh, Sambaba last year. Um, and it's, much, it's more and more independent, it's over there and I can actually focus on the next uh, new thing. I, I very much view myself as an entrepreneur and the entrepreneur needs to, I believe, uh, let go. Uh, I think, think very few entrepreneurs are good at starting a business and good at running a business. I don't think it's the same mindset. So I love the initial rush. I love the, love the startup phase. I love the move from nothing to something. But once it's there and it's running, and especially with Tabitha and Rashad and the, the good work that they've done and they are doing to set it up pro properly, a guy like me is just a nuisance. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm not much help. Uh, in the proper running of a medium-sized business. Pointing a CEO over Skills Academy for me was very much a milestone uh, kind of evidence that we've gotten it right um, and we're you know now building a management team um, and Rashad is busy building a management team. 
uh, of professional managers. And you know, me, uh, I need to be busy with the new thing. And that, that for me is kind of the, the end of the second phase. Uh, I guess College SA was the first phase, Skills Academy for me was the second phase. And since uh, about a year or so ago, I mostly actually focused on Metric College. Um, so for me, Metric College is kind of uh, round three. Um, you know, that whole thing of there was nothing, now you've got to put a whole new college in place. How do you do that? How do you do that properly? How do you do it fast? And yeah, you know, why Metric? Uh, right throughout my working career in education, which is probably nearly 30 years, I've always had this awareness of how important metric is for people. Um, I, I disagree often with how important people see it, but that's just in South Africa, people just believe metric is an absolutely important thing. It's a life goal. You must have it. If you don't have it, that's a bad thing. Um, and I know the stats, you know, half of the kids who start school are not going to finish matric. So of the 800,000 kids that write matric uh, every year, you know, there's another 800,000 who never got there. They never even got to matric. Um, and matric college is really saying for, for those people, whether you failed matric, whether you never even got to matric, whether you want to improve your matric, um, that's our focus. Um, yeah, and, and we can see there's a real demand. Um, yeah, and, and now we've, we are trying to figure out, you know, how do we do it better? Um, try to understand more what exactly people's needs are. Um, if to do adult, uh, I mean, we offer the adult metric. To do adult metric, you need grade nine. You need to have passed grade nine. And what, of course, we now find is there are people who haven't passed grade nine. They are, you know, working adults and they need to get an education. So we are looking at bringing on board a program uh, for people who don't even have grade nine. You know, we're going to put you on an ABET program. If you pause that, then you go on to your adult matric, you can still end up with a matric. And I think uh, success for me will be, you know, hopefully two, three years from now, I'll be able to say there is matric college. It has its own CEO, not me. Um, and I will be busy with, uh, I guess, the next college. I think the, the demand for education in South Africa is so big. There are so many people who want to improve their education that in our lifetime, neither government nor private business is going to be able to build all the education, whether it's classroom colleges or distance learning or universities or whatever. Um, we will never be able in our lifetime to build enough uh, places for everybody who wants to study to be able to study. Um, so I think it's a, there's this huge demand and I'll probably spend the rest of my life just building more colleges uh, towards uh, meeting that demand. Yeah, I, I guess my last, my final thought about all of this, um, I think the next challenge, uh, especially for us in distance learning, is to get, get more involved, to get better, to get more focused on the career element. You know, the, the adult who comes to a distance learning college to study is doing it to get a job or to improve their career, to take a career step. And I think there's a lot we can still do, uh, but more things we could do to help people get that job, to teach them about how do I go about getting a job, um, to help them get that uh, career step up. I think there's a lot of education, call it mentoring if you want to. Um, to really, really become good at equipping your student with the tools they need to get the job. Um, the, 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 the piece of paper, the qualification doesn't get you the job. So how do you get that job? You know, the piece of paper doesn't get you the promotion. So how do you get the promotion? And I hope that our next focus, uh, our, in the next few years, our focus will be more and more about not just educating the person, not just helping them get a qualification, but helping them learn, equipping them with the tools uh, to actually really truly get that job and to get that promotion. Um, because I do think in the end that's why people come to us. Um, but in the studies leads to jobs, you know, studies leads to promotions. And I believe we need to get better at making that link. Um, and we need to get better at helping students get, get what they really uh, are after, which is the job or the promotion with the salary increase. Yeah, so hopefully 
you know, developing more colleges and getting more focused on jobs and careers uh, is what I'm going to be busy with for the next few years. Thank you.